Okay. Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Dr. George Neal, and I'll be moderating the panel here this morning. We had some excellent discussions yesterday. Factors in determining where we're eventually going to get to and how quickly that's going to be accomplished involves the decisions that are made and the actions that are taken by the U.S. government. So thanks to Diane for trying to set the stage here this morning on that topic. This panel is going to have an opportunity to really dig in and address some of those fine points and to entertain your questions on those topics. I've had the chance to know Diane for a number of different years, a number of years, and work with her in, in several different capacities, including during my tenure at the FAA Office of Commercial Space Transportation, and more recently in partnering as part of the AIAA Space Traffic Management Working Group. And I have to tell you, it's been a real pleasure. She not only has the curiosity and the insights into these topics, but her dedication and commitment to trying to resolve the thorny space legal issues in this context is very impressive, and it's been great to have a chance to work with her. Since no one formally introduced her this morning before her comments, let me take that opportunity and note that she is not only the Chief Counsel for Space Commerce at the U.S. Department of Commerce, but she's also a non-resident scholar at here, the UT Austin Strauss Center for International and Security Studies, and an adjunct professor in the School of Law. She's helping to develop Strauss Center's Space Security and Safety Program, which is a transdisciplinary program offering opportunities to work on solutions to the challenges in, in we face in the space environment through a combination of law, policy, engineering, and science curricula. Uh, she first became involved in space endeavors back in 2004, and after working as a staff attorney in the Florida appellate courts for some years, she made the decision to specialize in space law and attended McGill's University, the Institute of Air and Space Law. And her master's thesis centered upon private space law issues, and her doctor work fo focused on effective spaceport regulation. She's involved in a number of legal projects, both domestically and internationally, and currently serves as the Executive Secretary of the International Institute of Space Law. Joining Diane on the panel this morning is Dr. J.C. Liu from NASA. He is the Chief Scientist for Orbital Debris for NASA, also serves as the Program Manager of NASA's Orbital Debris Program Office. He's responsible for overseeing orbital debris measurement, modeling, and risk assessment efforts to support NASA missions. Dr. Liu has more than 20 years of experience leading various orbital debris research projects, including environmental modeling, in situ measurements, laboratory impact experiments, and orbital debris mitigation policy development. He's a member of the U.S. government delegation to the United Nations Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space. He also serves as the head of the NASA delegation to the Interagency Space Debris Coordination Committee. Finally, we're pleased to welcome Jeff Braxton, who's a graduate of the Maxwell School of Citizenship and Public Affairs at Syracuse University and a Strategic Leadership Fellow affiliated with the National Strategic Research Institute at the University of Nebraska. He currently work, works at Headquarters U.S. Space Command in the Strategy Plans and Policy Directorate's Security Engagement Division, spearheading engagement with the U.S. interagency and international partners. So Jeff has a lot of experience in uh, the U.S. Department of Defense, advanced planning and executive execution enterprise. He's performed chief analyst duties at the joint, now combined, Space Operations Center in California, and has a lot of experience both in and out of uniform in space launch and space lift range operations. So welcome to all the panelists. And with that, uh, let me first offer each of the panelists a, a few minutes just to set the stage from their perspective on the whole issue of, of space traffic management 
from the lens in which they uh, are looking at the world. So Diane, you had a chance to represent the office. Any additional comments you have uh, to set the stage here? No, I, I think, uh, first of all, I want to say it feels like we're on our phone calls, right? <laughs> we're just missing a few players, but I feel like I need a phone and we, we should be, you know, no, <laughs> commerce clears. <laughs> but um, it, it's my pleasure to be here on this panel because it was a really wonderful experience working with these two gentlemen and everybody else that was on those calls. And it was my first experience in the interagency when I came aboard Commerce, I think the first day I was there, they said, oh, by the way, it's a Tuesday, you're going to do this call. And so, and it was a wonderful experience. So that's how, what I would like to start with by saying that I, I don't think that people um, always understand and appreciate the role of the interagency in the work that we do across the government, but certainly where it comes to space where, um, you know, the, li the lanes are, I, I said earlier that we need to respect one another's lanes, but they, they, you know, sometimes we have some shared jurisdictions, and so, it's, it's uh, really important that we listen to each other and work together. And, and for me, I have to say I've learned so much just from the last few months of working with the two of you. So that, that, that's the only thing I have to offer. Okay, thanks, Dan. How about from NASA, JC? What's your view? So uh, the, the topic of this panel is about uh, uh, challenges and opportunities uh, for space traffic management. Uh, the SPD-3, the uh, National Space Traffic Management Policy, highlights uh, the importance of uh, orbital debris uh, mitigation in support of the space situation awareness and space uh, traffic management. The biggest difference uh, between uh, space traffic management and air traffic management is orbital debris, which also represents the biggest challenge as we for, uh, move forward to, to walk into this uh, space traffic management arena. So I have about five minutes, right? So I'm going to talk in a general way the risk from orbital debris. As of today, uh, uh, the CSPAC is tracking the biggest objects in the environment. Uh, so they are tracking about 23,000 or so biggest objects in the environment. Those objects are about 10 centimeters and larger in low Earth orbit and about one meter and larger in geo region. At NASA, we use additional ground-based radars, telescopes, and in situ measurement to characterize debris too small to be tracked, but still large enough to threaten human space flight and robotic missions. Based on the NASA data, we estimate that the debris population at the one centimeter and larger level is approximately 500,000. So compare that with 23,000 objects being tracked. For the debris at one millimeter, very small, one millimeter and larger, the population is on the order of 100 million, 10 to the eight. And it is well known that the mission ending risk to operational spacecraft, again, the mission ending risk is driven by small mini meter size orbital debris. When your spacecraft is being hit by a big piece of debris, 20, 30 centimeters in size, the outcome is likely to be a catastrophic destruction of your spacecraft. So you'll break up into many, many pieces to further pollute the environment. When the critical components of your spacecraft, such as the fuel tank, pressure light components, your battery box, is being hit by a piece of debris about one or two millimeters in size. The outcome is not catastrophic, but the damage is severe enough to cause your fuel to leak out, your pressure line to come out, damage your battery and other critical components to end your mission early. And because there are so many more small debris than large debris, the mission ending risk is driven by small, mini, meter sized orbital debris. So as we talk about the, the, the challenges for improving space situation awareness, of course, it is very important to improve the, the accuracy of object tracking and conjunction assessments. But even if you could track object down to one centimeter in size and put those one centimeter and larger object into your conjunction assessment process and then conduct uh, collision 
avoidance maneuvers to mitigate high-risk conjunctions against one centimeter and larger object. That still only accounts for less than 1%, let me repeat, less than 1% of the mission ending risk from orbital debris for operational spacecraft. Therefore, again, as we look into a technology to improve object tracking and the conjunction assessment process, it is equally important, if not more important, to look into the gap in the space situation awareness on the small particle, mini meter size particle, which drive the mission ending risk to operational spacecraft. Thanks, JC. Jeff, uh, what's your perspective? So I just wanted to share a couple of kind of raw thoughts to whet the appetite. I really don't want to give you guys a lecture here uh, or a sermon, but um, Couple of things, kind of level setting from from my perspective as a, an academic, more of an academic than a uh, civil servant today, is that um, SSA space situational awareness is not space domain awareness. Um, we're working that in our shop for uh, fixing up the doctrine, the military doctrine. Um, we're thinking as we move forward at the ever so. Um, rapid pace of the uh, interagency and, and, in, and in this case the internal workings of the Defense Department. Um, that's kind of sarcasm if you didn't pick up on it. Uh, <laughs> anybody who heard me talk last year about us going fast when we, we are from, from, a, from a certain point of view um, is that uh, we believe space situational awareness to be a subset encapsulated in you know a subset of space domain awareness. Any thoughts you guys have please? Shoot me notes. Uh, I'm, I'm not the smartest guy uh, by far. Um, and then another thing is that neither space situational awareness nor space domain awareness are space traffic coordination and space traffic management. For the longest time, folks in our community kind of have conflated the two, and it really does cause some 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 uh, some trouble trying to work forward and trying to get uh, those who aren't experts on space to uh, to understand what you're doing, why you're trying to do it, and why you need resources, uh, especially at the, the interagency and above level. Um, so, you know, there's kind of tying back into what Diane was talking about. There's a lot of uh, areas of overlap within the U.S. interagency. When we did the orbital debris mitigation standard practices runs, was it 41 or 42 telecons, Jason? 44. 44. Apparently I missed a couple. Um, but, you know, we don't always agree but there's certainly a lot of overlapping equities. Um, however, one of the things that I'd like to kind of focus my, my, remark, my uh, remarks that, that are about to come is that, you know, sometimes that overlapping is a blessing and at other times it's a, it's a curse or more of a curse. But I, I want to focus this morning on what squarely falls within the, um, the purview of U.S. Department of Defense, and that is um, war fighting, but war fighting focused on security and defense. And um, I, I, I want to start off uh, by saying that in today's complex geopolitical landscape, there's no shortage of threats to the security of the United States, its allies, and its other partners. In a new era, or a reborn era, that's Jeff's opinion, of strategic competition among great powers, um, the uh, security and defense elements got to be ready to fight large-scale combat operations in a combined, uh, that is, multinational uh, fashion in an all-domain environment. Not a multi-domain environment, not a cross-domain environment, but an all-domain environment. And all this needs to be done under the most demanding of conditions. Uh, some of those conditions uh, we would see as extreme um, from our point of view. Uh, future conflicts require that this combined force, the one comprised of the U.S. and its allies, uh, charities in the room. Uh, as everyone knows, charity is a veteran of the Canadian Armed Forces. Thank you for our service. But uh, charity and I worked as in the combined arms business when when we when she was in uniform and I was working as a as a civil servant at the at the JSPOC, um, among other things. So this is nothing new. Um, I just wanted to highlight that as a real-world example, particular to the folks in the room today. But um, this combined force, uh, it's comprised of the U.S. and its allies, has to be the very best and most modern in the world. And, uh, you know, of particular interest to this audience today, um, space assets 
uh, absolutely require defense from anti-satellite weapons. Um, and don't, don't mistake that for a direct ascent ASAT from, you know, ground to space. Um, I, I consider anti-satellite weapons um, to be capable of coming from any of the domains, whether it be, you know, originating in space, uh, terrestrially, or in cyberspace. And, um, you know, th therefore it's uh, got to continue to uh, adapt and ensure that the combined force remains uh, the most powerful in terms of warfighting capability in the world and to basically demonstrate to a would-be adversary that they don't stand a fighting chance against this combined force. Therefore, restraint should be the best option available to them. So all that said, deterring aggression is its first task, uh, the, the, the combined force's first task, and it requires us to be maximally capable and ready for war fighting in every domain. That's kind of the bottom line uh, at the end rather than up front. So two big things to do that. I'm not going to say that one's more important than the other. Um, I would just see them as, as, uh, as at, at a minimum equal, and we can, you know, argue over beverages which one might be more important. But two things: we have to build a more lethal force. Uh, the surest way to deter adversary aggression is to be fully prepared for the contingency for the war, and we have to keep building on that readiness to fight, even if it's tonight. Uh, should our our respective nations call? Uh, and, and at the same time, modernizing our key capabilities for future conflicts. So it's twofold. It's being ready to, to go tonight. It's also being ready to go 10 years from now. Um, and there's really no room for complacency. Uh, there's no room for us to waste human power or money. Uh, and then the second thing is to strengthen our alliances. Personally, Jeff Braxton, speaking uh, from my more academic than governmental hat, I think this is probably a bit more important than the lethal force, but, but maybe only by a small measure. But we have to strengthen our alliances and attract new partners and establish and nurture those new partnerships. It's not enough to just establish it, but you have to grow it. Um, and so our allies and partners play the essential role of helping us to deter conflict and to defend our interests around the world. So through continued engagement, um, we'll grow these relationships and uh, deepen our interoperability, deep, deepen our capability and readiness, and therefore make the deterrence calculus come out in our favor. So it's probably too much, but thank you, and I'm an uh, absolute honor to be with this panel in particular, and uh, a pleasure to be here with you all this morning. Great, thank you. So let's dig in with some questions. First, a, a basic one, Jeff, back to you. Can you explain your understanding of the difference between U.S. Space Command and U.S. Space Force? That's a good question because that's one that's getting continually conflated and uh, kind of being a, a, a wise a wise cracking kid from uh, Philadelphia growing up. I, uh, I've been saying uh, U.S. Space Command, God, that's so 2019. You know, 2020 is all about U.S. Space Force. But um, in, in the simplest terms I can muster, U.S. Space Command is focusing on the actual how we would do the war fighting um, should we need to, uh, again, with the ultimate mission being deterrence. And you can go look at the U.S. Space Command fact sheet. I'd be happy to send it to you. And that's the first D of the four Ds is deterrence. And then everything else comes after that. But with that said, it's, it's similar to the European commander Indo-PACOM Command, or gosh, even U.S. Northern Command, the focus is on operational uh, activities, war fighting. And um, people say, well, can't you do that? Why, why did you need a U.S. Space Command? Well, part of that was we woke up and realized that, hmm, there could be things going on space to space. And similarly, there could be things going on from space to ground. Um, and so we kind of rethought how the lines on the area responsibility map play out. And um, I disagree with our friends at CSIS in DC, um, despite my affiliation with Syracuse University. And uh, um, that, uh, that dynamic of space to space and space to terrestrial um, has really demanded that, that space be an area responsibility with a specific um, commander 
uh, in charge of it from a U.S. point of view. So think about that kind of a thing. And um, the U.S. Space Force is to get kind of after the other pieces that services, whether it be the Army, Navy, Air Force, Marine Corps, what have you, on actually organizing, training, and equipping the capabilities and people, the talent necessary for U.S. Space Command to be ready to execute its warfighting mission um, should the Turks fail. So I, I think that's a bit of it. And um, hopefully I didn't use too much jargon in that, but uh, happy to, to take more discussions when the opportunity, or uh, questions from the folks here when the opportunity arises. Okay, thanks. So, JC, it seems like we've seen decades of efforts to limit the generation of new debris, but the orbital debris population continues to increase over time. So what is the problem? So, so, uh, so there are several reasons why the orbital debris uh, population continues to increase over time. You know, as of today, you know, I already gave you the, the number distribution of the objects in the environment, but in terms of the mass, as of today, we have more than 8,100 metric tons of material in space. And the expectation is that the number will continue to increase. The biggest reason for that really is we do have good orbital debris mitigation policies guidelines, requirements, and best practices. For example, a key uh, uh, element in the orbit debris mitigation uh, policy and requirements and standard practices is to limit the long-term presence of object in low Earth orbit. So th we have this so-called 25-year rule, meaning if you have a structure, an upper stage or spacecraft operating in low Earth orbit, uh, which is the region below 2,000 kilometer altitude. So instead of, at the end of the mission, leave your structure in the environment for decades, centuries, or longer, so that it could eventually collide with other objects in the environment. Instead of doing that, you try to follow the 25-year rule, meaning at the end of the mission operation, you use some remaining fuel to lower the perigee or the orbit of the structure so that the drag force in the atmosphere would cause the structure to naturally decay in 25 years or less. So we call that the 25-year rule. NASA established the 25-year rule exactly 25 years ago. Unfortunately, as of today, if you look at the global compliance with the 25-year rule, Let's forget about CubeSats, no? released from space station, CubeSats, small satellites. They will all come down naturally in 25 years or less, so they don't really count. If you take out those CubeSats and small satellites, on average, the global compliance with the 25-year rule over the past 10 years is about 30%. That is the problem. So that, no, we need to do a better job to follow existing orbital debris mitigation policy guidelines, requirements, and standard practices to better limit the generation of new debris in the future. So Diane, let me ask you to put your legal hat on for a while and uh, talk a little bit about some of the greatest legal challenges to improving the safety of space operations. Oh, my, my. Okay. Well, I think one of the legal challenges is that we have right now, um, and I'm going to speak first U.S. and then internationally, and what we have in place with regard to the safety of, of space operations here in the U.S. that's actually enforceable with regard to that safety really um, falls uh, within those lanes that I mentioned earlier. So the FAA, your former office, is in charge of the safety of launch and reentry, the ground operations at spaceports, the FCC licenses and is in charge of the safety of telecommunications activities, and we at Commerce are also 
uh, in charge of the licensing of commercial remote sensing. And even though right now we're all undergoing a streamlining of our regulations, um, and certainly space flight space light safety will, will fall into those streamlinings because it's a universal driver and it's something that we're all conscious of and aware of. It only goes so far. So, um, you know, the payload review is, it deals with some aspects of the operations, um, but it really only talks about the safety of that payload as it really relates to the launch. So there are limitations here in the U.S. And what we have from a legal standpoint instead are the things that we build into launch service agreements and um, the things that operators uh, impose upon themselves in a, in a more self-regulatory um, aspect, but those are not binding. So that's, that's a challenge right there. And when you look at things from an international standpoint, um, there too, I mean, safety is not something that's, I, well, first of all, international law relies upon that domestic law that I just talked about in order to be enforceable. So there are limitations. I mean, it's something that we all, um, speak of in aspirational terms, we talk about and commit to and come to international agreement as to what those social values are that we um, all come all agree on, but that only goes so far from a safety standpoint, and that's a, that is a legal challenge right now. Now, the hook, if you will, is that states are responsible, internationally liable for the activities of their nationals, whether they be governmental or non-governmental. And so there are, you know, and that can be as, as stringent as an absolute liability for something that happens if the, uh, the damage or the injury is to somebody on earth or somebody in an aircraft or fault-based. And I will posit to you that some of the difficulties in, in approaching the legal, the, the, the legal aspects of liability in orbit are probably going to benefit, you know, causation is going to be maybe a little bit uh, less of a challenge as we get better and better at observations and, and really a lot of the RPOs and, and, and some of the space-based imaging is, are things that can be used in a forensic capacity which will help us deal with some of those things from, from a causation standpoint and a liability standpoint. But it is a challenge and it's, it's a challenge partially because so many new activities are coming online and so we're looking at safety in a whole different way. It used to be that, um, I, and I, I will offer another thing as well, as we start to see um, more congested uh, orbits and we see the interactions between these much larger constellations of much smaller satellites and the increasing activity. I mean, we have, we have MEV out there right now, so as we start to see uh, these kinds of things, I think that insurance, it, it used to be that launch insurance was, you know, a given, pretty much, but now, and on-orbit insurance was discretionary, but I think some of that, those, those things are going to shift, and I think that's going to help fill in the gaps. Jeff, what value do you think our, our partners and allies can bring to the game in terms of uh, ensuring safety, stability, security for the long haul? Um, yeah. So personally, I think that's absolutely where, where the nexus lies, where the, 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 the uh, center of mass is, if you will. Um, I know we've done a bit. Um, I think we've got a long way to go. And kind of getting back to Diane's uh, keynote remarks earlier, um, we're doing good. We can't assume that's good enough. We got to continue to work. Um, uh, we're, we're, we're continually working to strengthen our uh, partnerships, the Combined Space Operations Initiative, initiative officially at the Principals Board a few weeks ago. Um, Japan and Germany are now officially part of the Combined Space Operations Initiative in addition to um, the UK, uh, Canada, and Australia, as well as the US, obviously. Um, and we're continuing to push forward on that. Um, some Italy and Japan are, are scratching at the door. Um, so that kind of focus is a little bit more on a military to military, government to government type piece. But clearly, the things that are going on, civil and commercial, um, have to not only uh, continue, but they have to increase pace. 
and we got to figure out how to do that. Um, and it is truly, if we're going to, I look at safety and um, security and stability, those three attributes. I kind of see those um, as kind of the three, three pillars, if you will, of space sustainability. And so um, I think when you look at those in order to be safe, in order to be secure, in order to be stable, um, you can't, no one, no one party can do it alone. And therefore it's absolutely incumbent upon, upon a, a par a partnerships. And, you know, even a few years ago at the um, space symposium, General Hyten said, you know, I want to partner with everybody, even, any, anybody want to know? Russia and China, some folks were in the room. And yes, we got a lot of phone calls in my shop of that. Did the general say what he meant to say? And I said, that's what he wanted to say because sustain, uh, sustainability of space demands nothing less. Um, and so uh, I think that's, that's really the key. And that's why earlier I kind of said, you know, building a more lethal combined force is, is one thing, but strengthening alliances and uh, existing partnerships and then forging new ones and having those partnerships across the board be meaningful, not just words on a printed page is, is crucial. JC, under Space Policy Directive 3, the National Space Traffic Management Policy, NASA was asked to lead a U.S. government interagency working group to update the orbital debris mitigation standard practices. I understand that update was completed a couple of months ago. Can you give a few examples of some of the key elements of that update? Okay. Yes. So, uh, well, thanks to Diane, Jeff, and the other 82 representatives from seven departments and agency, we completed this task uh, late last year. And let me just uh, give you a, a few examples. Uh, so uh, if you look at today's uh, catalog the track objects, the catalog population is dominated by fermentation debris. Objects generated from explosions or collisions involving uh, upper stages or spacecraft. And if you look at today's uh, uh, fermentation debris population being tracked, about 60%, 60% of fermentation debris, they were the outcome of ac accidental explosions. Therefore, in the updated o ODMSP, we established a limit uh, to limit the probability of accidental explosion for future uh, spacecraft and upper stages. So how do you meet this, uh, this threshold? You need to improve the design of your critical systems, you know, your propulsion system, your power system, so that, and also uh, improve how you build those components uh, to better limit the probability of accidental explosion in the future. And this one in a thousand probability limit has been demonstrated to be achievable. So it is a meaningful new number to be added to the ODMSP to limit the generation of accidental explosion uh, fragments in the future. So that, that's one highlight. Now, the ODMSP, we had about 15 major updated or new elements. So that's one of them. The other one is we try to establish aspirational goals. So. The ODMSP, the standard practices, uh, if you will, they are the minimum requirements. We like to encourage the owner and operator to go above and beyond to have aspirational goals. And as I mentioned earlier, the 25-year rule is a key element to limit the long-term presence of object in low Earth orbit. And if you look at the, the benefit of the 25-year rule and the cost associated with following the 25-year rule, and if, if you compare that with the benefit of changing the 25-year rule to a five-year rule, the benefit is really a second-order effect. So when you look at the benefit and cost, the 25-year rule is still a very good reasonable number across the board. But at the same time, we want to encourage people to do you know, better, do a better job. So in the ODMSP, for the very first time, we established the a preferred disposal option, meaning at the end of your mission operation, our recommendation is to remove your structure immediately from the environment. You can do that by putting your structure on an Earth escape heliocentric trajectory 
or bring it right down. Equivalently, this is a zero-year rule. So that is another highlight in the updated ODMSP, which is we establish aspirational goals for the operator to, to follow so that as the technology improves, eventually we can all do a better job to better protect the environment. Diane, you talked earlier today about all the many things that the Office of Space Commerce is, is doing right now. Let me ask you to just step back for a moment and, and think about what does success look like for the office? Uh, if things go well, where do you see us ending up? Oh, okay. Perfect world. I am the queen and I am the judge. We get money from Congress. We have already got our processes in place as an office. So we know we, we have people that are working on all these things right now. We continue our relationships. We have a, a person that's out at Vandenberg working with the 18th, learning how that system works, the, the glitches. Um, you know, a lot of people in, in this room have come and spoken to us, so we take advantage of all, of all that. Our, our cloud is up and running. It's, we've gone beyond the UDL, and we've moved into working with a, a bigger, better cloud, and we have a, a, a completely modern little mission center somewhere, I don't know where, that doesn't look anything like the 18th. It doesn't have 80 people. It has, it, it, it looks more like a, a commercial mission control center. Some of you have them, and, or like, or like Swipsy, which is is like maybe you know four to six people at any given time and it's it's nimble and there's an ecosystem and so we're bringing in information from all of you but we have figured out what basic service what does that mean what what is what is a better basic service a better mousetrap that we can provide at no cost to the owner operator and do it in a way so that they're not just looking at code going what the heck does this mean you know, this is a startup, and, and they, or, or it's a university, and they, they have, so we have that in place. We have really deep relationships in the international commercial community and also civil community that continue. Our relationships with the interagency are, are more robust than they are now, and I believe they're better now than they've, like, been for 30 years. So that, that's, that's some of what it looks like. I hope that answered. Okay. Uh, Jeff, let's... Look back in history a little bit. How did the DOD get involved in this topic in the first place? Um, well, we had this thing start called the, uh, the Cold War, and you know we had to figure out um, what was on orbit and what, you know what was orbital and what was suborbital. Uh, clearly, something that's suborbital is a little concerning, if not a lot concerning, because it could be a re-entering warhead. So we had to build that capability up and, um, you know, in the, in, in the geographic distribution sense, um, we have fewer radars than we've ever had, which is um, not a great place to be. Um, you know, at one point in time, we had tons of radars in uh, northern Canada, Canada called the, dis the dew line, distant early warning line. But, but it, it came, the, the need to have an on-orbit catalog to differentiate between what's on orbit and what is uh, either ascending or descending, more importantly from us descending, uh, was born out of that need um, and it was viewed as a military function because space was, uh, was, was uh, assumed to be a benign environment, only nation states um, more industrialized and less industrialized nation states were, were utilizing space. And so, as we can realize, that's not the situation today. But, and that's why the Department of Defense is, is looking at, hey, you know, the way we're structured under our Constitution and in public law, there's a lot of things that can and should be done that, frankly, um, in our construct, the Department of Defense couldn't do and or shouldn't do. So... That's why, I mean, a lot of the, the things, and, and hopefully it comes through to Diane and JC and others is, um, and even your time, George, when you were the voice crying out in the desert and uh, if not outright evangelical about all this, uh, leading, the, leading the, 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 the messaging part, if nothing else, and it was more um, in the interagency uh, and your time at FAA. But um, we're, we're trying to be good partners, not to lead it, you know, and... Um, 
but we also don't want to kind of drop the ball on the floor and walk away and, and assume someone's going to pick it up. And frankly, uh, in our work with commerce to date, it's, I have to keep emphasizing it's, it's about building an enduring integrated partnership. So when you talk about that little op center that might be somewhere and wherever, I, I see a world where I am, maybe I'm sending military people like we, from, from what's called the 18th today to that center as, a, as kind of a, a, a cool duty assignment, um, similar to the way we send um, U.S. Air Force uh, uh, pilots and, uh, and, you know, and others to the FAA centers to do their thing. So I see a lot of opportunities there, but um, I don't think there's any disagreement within the department that, that yeah, we want to make sure that, uh, that we are fully integrated um, into the new reality that Diane just uh, expressed uh, many good attributes of as we move forward. So speaking of partnerships, JC, uh, can you envision a, a whole of government approach to SSA and SDM? And, and if so, what would that look like? Well, so uh, NASA is not a regulatory agency, uh, but NASA has a long history of providing uh, research in technology development and technical support to other uh, federal departments and agency. And so uh, right now, Commerce would take the lead you know, uh, in developing the space traffic management best practices and system uh, for the U.S. government with support from DOD, from FAA, from FCC, and NASA. So we will continue to provide you know, technical support, but again, we look for the Commerce Department's leadership uh, to lead the U.S. government to establish the space traffic management system in the United States and eventually working with the State Department, take that to the international community to work with the international community to come up with a system that the global aerospace community could follow. And, and even now, I mean, we are working with people at Goddard quite a bit because I, I, saw, I know I saw Matt Hajek here early somewhere, somewhere here. Somewhere yeah. here. Um, I think he's wearing a turquoise sweater today. <laughs> but, um, but, but I know that we have a lot of interactions because not only does NASA have a, a lot of, uh, provide support, but also incredible still research and expertise, which we need to draw upon all of that. I mean, the, the best thing to do is not to reinvent a wheel, but to you know, continue the momentum of what is already going and, and, and then you get further. Wow, and so, uh, and, and we've already started, you know, really drawing upon that. You know, we, we have somebody out at DOD, but we're constantly interacting with uh, NASA Goddard and also NASA Ames. So, Diane, how about with the international community? Uh, what would you say are the, are the next steps in terms of what needs to be done? Is it, is it treaties? Is it bilaterals? Is it guideline development? Is it pilot programs? Uh, I, all of the above? I think the best starting point right now is implementation of the long-term sustainability guidelines. We have 21 I mean, yes, some of them restate the obvious, but it's a great starting point. And not only implementation, you know, what we're doing, but also showing other countries, and doing this, of course, coordinated through the State Department, but showing how other countries are already doing things that are implementing a lot of these guidelines that they don't even realize they're doing. And then I think you, you start to build an awareness of, of what the governance looks like. What does it mean? It's not something that's so far away, and it's something that's not overwhelmingly inaccessible. So I, I think uh, that that's one piece of it. You start with the implementation, much of which SPD3 is it's implementing B3, B4, and B5 in the guidelines. Um, I think we, um, we continue to work very closely with the State Department and certainly with regard to um, international cooperation and, and STM, SSA and STM. Um, when we, I, I mentioned earlier that we're working on uh, cooperative agreements with other international partners and friends, and, and we do that, uh, we, we definitely uh, look to the State Department to give us guidance on how to put those together um, to make sure that um, we're, again, drawing upon their expertise. So. Um, the international piece of this is important, though, because I think, you know, if you want to be leaders, you, 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 you get out in front, but you definitely need everybody. We all need to do this together, and there is a lot of expertise in other parts of the world that we, we will be better. Again, why reinvent the wheel? Let's continue the momentum and all go, you know, we get further that way. Jeff, how do we balance the desire for transparency and orbital safety with the clear need to protect sensitive information 
um, related to national security. So um, there's, there's been a bit of a, mind, uh, a, a mindset change. So if you think about um, deterrence, I, I kind of look at what we're after is kind of how we, we do things in the, uh, the maritime domain, right? Space is more civil and commercial than national now. Um, whether it be, you know, intelligence base, military base, um, and we, we make that distinction, a lot of other nation states don't. Um, and the idea of how modern navies have taken on that, that uh, maritime security role to ensure that uh, strategic lines of communication on the high sea are safeguarded. Um, and so to that end, you know, and, and, and what I was talking a bit about earlier on deterrence, um, you have to be maximally transparent in order to assure your partners that you're a good partner. And some of the steps forward that we've taken, and, and I'm going to continue to push, um, and uh, is that under peacetime conditions, which um, the, the, the nascent evolving day-to-day -day campaign plan at U.S. Space Command focuses on always staying in peacetime where space is concerned. Um, so with that said, uh, under peacetime conditions, we really should be hiding very little. And um, we've done a pretty darn good job of that. Um, we have uh, put out a tremendous amount of additional parameterized information in the SATCAT master file, um, identifying uh, uh, period, inclination, apogee, perigees of objects we never did. You used to see no elements available in those in those fields. Um, we've also putting out TLEs. Um, behind the scenes within the interagency, I'm continuing to have that fight, but I'm kind of doing it um, bit by bit. You know, I want to make sure that I'm not holding my breath on panacea. You know, I'm not letting perfect at step one uh, be the enemy of good enough moving forward. So I would anticipate seeing that to continue. And interestingly, um, with some of our international partners, <laughs> since we're putting more information out, we're getting a lot of interesting questions on, hey, um, you have USA umpty frats. Might that be this satellite? And you know, so we're not at the point where we can say over the unclass line or what have you. Yeah, sure is. But as we continue to evolve the, um, uh, the confined space operations initiative, uh, the foundation of all that is, is that there is a real-time two-line element set in that, you know, enterprise at the secret releasable to CSPO level, if you will, um, that everyone can access real time. If it was updated five minutes ago, they see it. It might not say that it's you know, bougie bougie thing with you know the half twist and this one's got the new flux capacitor versus the old one. But it's it's hey, here's a point in space um, that's dynamic. And uh, so maybe it's not a point in space anymore, right? Um, and it increases our credibility and it fosters our partnerships. And so, um, and then when you look at the debris population, um, people go, man, you guys have, we had an interesting little situation, and I won't say too much, but it might have to do with copios, where they said, man, there's been like a whole bunch of breakup stuff because there's all this new debris in a catalog. And, you know, you kind of look at your shoes and go, well, that's debris that we just weren't talking about. And there's no point in not talking about debris to, to everything JC said. So we're going to continue to grind away at that. Um, I'm probably not well liked in certain cubicles, unmarked cubicles in Northern Virginia, but I really don't care about that. And we're going to continue to work that. JC, NASA clearly has a lot of technical expertise in this topic, but What's the best way for government to interact with the academic community to enable continued innovation and getting help solving technical problems and allowing students to learn and develop as part of being our future aerospace workforce? So uh, education and public outreach is really a high priority uh, for NASA. 
So we continue uh, to reach out uh, to the community, not only the commercial, but also academia, to encourage students to come and work with us as intern students or co-op students. And uh, last year, for the very first time, we organized the first international orbital debris conference in Houston. And the goal for the, the international orbital debris conference was to promote orbital debris research activities in the United States and also to foster, to encourage collaboration between the U.S. community and the international community. And we have a very successful event last year. And at the same time, we try to you know, go to meetings and conferences to promote the importance of orbital debris research and also to seek new idea, encourage new idea to come and work with us to address the orbital debris problem, the short-term problem, the long-term problem. There are just so many challenges waiting for us to address. And we need to all work together to, uh, to, to do a better job to protect you know, uh, not only the current but also future space missions, which I believe is the goal, the ultimate goal for space traffic management. Great. Well, why don't we open it up to uh, questions from the audience at this point? Uh, all right. So, should we have several? I know that there's a lot of questions. Um, interestingly enough, somebody knew how to get a hold of me on my cell phone, so there's a, somebody who's watching live stream has a question. Yeah, yeah. Say hi. Uh, so uh, the question from the person uh, watching live stream is, they heard JC speak about, you know, 99% of the hazardous stuff is untrackable. So what are some innovative ideas on how to better quantify and assess this untrackable population of objects? Okay. So that's a very good question. Uh, let me just give you one example. As of today, there are more than 400 operational spacecraft, more than 400, between 600 kilometers and 1,000 kilometer altitude. So that's where we are today, more than 400 operational spacecraft. Unfortunately, we do not have direct measurement data on the millimeter size orbital debris in that altitude regime, meaning those spacecraft, we don't really know what is driving the mission engine risk to those missions. Therefore, we need to encourage uh, the de development of technology, may not be ground-based, but could be uh, in-situ-based, uh, space-based uh, measurement technology to better uh, characterize, understand the small debris environment. And with the data, we can use the data to support the development and implementation of cost-effective protective measures you know, to protect the most critical components uh, of, of a spacecraft. And at the same time, we should encourage uh, new thinking and new technology on lightweight protective materials to better protect the key components, the fuel tanks, the battery boxes of the operational spacecraft. So those are the two key areas, technology to better characterize small debris and technology to improve the shielding material to better protect operational spacecraft. Uh, Jason Randolph from BlueStack. Uh, I also support the little commercial operations center that we use for the SACT events. For the audience, those SACT events are a uh, interesting thing. We're building a commercial, collaborative commercial ops center that we use during um, exercises that the National Space Defense Center um, puts on. So it's a very interesting event. It also gives us a chance to see what commercial ops would look like in that type of environment. But uh, my question is, um, I think, going to put Jeff on the spot a little bit. Um, one of the issues we run into working in that environment is we're bridging this gap between the unclassified world and the classified world. And there's still hesitation, Victoria touched on this yesterday, there's a lot of hesitation when it comes to the commercial companies operating fully gloves off and processing uncorrelated targets and that kind of thing. So I've been, it's interesting working with the NSDC, I've been told, oh yeah, go gloves off, just do whatever you guys can do um, in a truly open and transparent kind of uh, commercial operations environment. I've also been told, and stop doing that. Um, so uh, is there guidance, is there existing guidance from US STRATCOM or is there anything in the works that would provide clearer information about what the, what the commercial companies can do without getting in trouble? So we have to make some distinctions, right? Um, we could and it, uh, we only have a lever on things that are U.S.-based, right? So 
if you were to be draconian there, they'll just become multinationally based or go to a different country, and that's not good for our, our equities. I think the vision and intent of our commanders, um, General Raymond gets it, the reason why we're doing the things that we're doing that I spoke about uh, recently with increased transparency uh, is been pushed by him for years now since he was a two-star and, uh, and my boss at, at Strategic Command back in the 2012-2013 time frame. So I think that the vision and intent of the commander, there's no, there's no, there's no ambiguity. Um, you, you know, report what you see. Um, and so, um, and, and we know having sat, you know, side saddle um, with General D.T. Thompson um, during an EXO demo a couple of years ago, um, I know there was things on there, of course, they were pointing to him going, hey, look, we're tracking this thing real good, but it isn't in your catalog, is not it? And, you know, we're, okay, fine. The, we'd like to have that additional data. Um, so I don't think, I know there's a lot of folks out there um, that want to go back to 1985. Um, back when I was working for General Raymond, we were in with General Kaler, just a little vignette, and um, General Kaler said, Jeff, you need to tell those people that uh, it's not 1985 anymore, and it ain't ever going to be 1985 again. So the domain has changed, the environment has changed. So I, I don't see us really pushing hard. I, I wouldn't push hard on anybody else in the interagency to go be draconian with folks, whether they're U.S.-based or otherwise, to, to not find, you know, detect and track and provide the observational data. Quite the contrary, because I think at some point we're going to want to look at the or open architecture data repository at Commerce to be kind of the landing pad for that kind of stuff. So um, it's iterative. I, I, another piece too is now that General Hyten is the Vice Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, I'm, I'm convinced he shares that vision as well. So, um, and that's kind of the weird position we've been placed in at the Department of Defense is we're the ones kind of responsible as we sit today for reporting to the world um, in, a lot of, in a lot of cases. Um, but then we have other partners in the interagency who I, I personally, academic, you know, National Strategic Research Institute had on. I, I personally think it's a lot of folks at a lower level in these organizations that see the changes we're making as upsetting their apple cart and making them lose sleep at night, you know, making them ring hands more than they would otherwise ring them. So to be blunt, um, they need to either evolve their thinking or probably find something else to do with their lives and professional energies because we're not going backwards. Charity, did you still have a question or no? I remember. I remember. Um, it's a two-parter. Uh, it seems to me that space debris limits freedom of action in space for defense and security purposes to, you know, conduct your operations and do what you need to do. What is DOD doing uh, to mitigate and remediate space debris so you can have greater freedom of action? And also, I'd like to hear from both Diane and you on the interesting, how we're about to enter where there's a lot more commercial activity in space, thousands of satellites doing commercial activity, how DOD is going to be following the same rules as the commercial community when it comes to uh, traffic management or traffic uh, coordination? And how will that interplay? It's not like airspace where you can have separation and altitude or outrevs and, and things like that. Thank you. So I guess, that, I guess that one's to me too, huh? So I, th I think we're a little closer than so there's two things, right? We, we talked about this many, many telecons. We had to make the distinction of the dis distinct or the distinction to kind of moderate the folks in, in JC's technical working group on what's the difference between mitigation and remediation. Remediation being you've already realized the risk. You know, you've gone past that point and mitigation didn't work. Now you're in remediation. So I don't see remediation as entirely a Department of Defense problem to solve, but we have dumped some dollars into things like you know, what happens when that satellite just croaks and you can't command and control it and it's in an operational orbit? So things like the RSGS initiative to try to, 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 to 
get these ideas of uh, on-orbit servicing or, or using an on-orbit servicer as a tug to get things out and uh, hopefully into a, a much better orbit. Um, and one thing that I throw in there as well, Charity, is that um, the, the standards, the orbital debris mitigation standard practices, um, we already hold ourselves to a bit of a higher standard to begin with on that as, as a Department of Defense and by and large the Department of the Air Force. Um, so, uh, so there's that, there's that element. And then when it comes to the, how do you actually operate, how do you fly, um, again, the, the goal is to establish an environment, and, and that's why I say it's not norms of behavior as much as operational best practices, rules of the road, um, and those focused on peacetime environment. So military aircraft, for instance, that come out of um, Offutt, the um, KC, or uh, I'm sorry, RC-135 rivet joints, electronic intelligence aircraft. When they're flying um, and they're not in mission, they're operating as if they're in, they're a mode three squawking um, commercial civil type asset. So um, we, I would envision, I mean, honestly, guys, if I could find a way to, to get all of our objects, I can't, I can't speak for the non-DOD objects, but just the DOD objects, which we do have 100% control of, to squawk a tail code day in and day out, whether it's via RF, whether it's optically, whether it's all of the above, under peacetime conditions, I'd love to see that. Frankly, and this is probably a little dastardly, because if things start getting weird and we start drifting away from peace into crisis and moving faster into conflict, I might want to turn those off as a tactic to send signal to the to the would-be bad actors and, and, and to get the responsible folks in the community on board saying, say, look, this is getting weird. We, you know, we need to, and, and get us to move on, you know, de-escalating, creating off-ramps, all that sort of thing. And that's what we really don't have when you, when you just hide in the darkness, you know, if you have a doomsday machine and nobody knows about it, how, how do you leverage that uh, in, a, in a strategic sense? And the answer is you can't. And so that's why a lot of the things, and, but cultures, it's a culture shift and it takes time. So, and, and constant pressure on the, the community to make the culture shift. So I, I actually, I don't think we answered the second part of your question. So if I could jump in there, because I think you directed it at both of us. And I think what I heard you say was, um, at such time when we have some rules of the road or some norms, um, how does DOD um, factor into that? Because certainly we're not the boss of them. So am I right? Did I characterize that about, about right? So what I'm, I, I'm going to kind of echo what Jeff said. He, he said that whatever, you know, even the standard practices, they're, they're based on operational realities. Modeling, what, what is the cost benefit if we make you know, this, this probability as opposed to this one or this, this time frame? So when you base norms and ultimately rules of the road or whatever you want to call them on those operational realities, they make sense. And so one would think that whatever the, um, the result of that norms, rules making, whatever it is, is going to be so grounded in the operational realities and, and makes so much sense that it's just going to be a natural and it's going to create a much more predictable environment. And that's really adding to the security, the safety, and the stability that Jeff started out with. So that, that's, I, I think that's my answer. Chuck Spillar out of MITRE, Colorado Springs. Um, JC, you had mentioned catastrophic damage that could be done to a satellite with things down as low as you know, 10, 20 millimeters. Um, Space Fence is coming online pretty soon. They're going to be able to track in the two to five centimeter range, adding potentially another half a million objects to the debris catalog. In addition to that, we've got FAA filings for upwards of 50,000 new active satellites that are coming into the catalog. What, what I see is there's a problem with the way we do CDM messages today. If the statistics that I'm looking at right now are correct, back in 2018, 18 Space sent out roughly 10,000 emergency CDMs during the course of 2018. That averages out to about 25 a day. How do you scale to a potential catalog that's exponentially larger than the 25,000 that we have now in terms of doing conjunction assessment messaging 
and giving, giving the owner operators the, the information that they need to, to accurately make an assessment whether they need to move or not. So I would let Jeff uh, talk about the, the catalog management aspect uh, later. But in terms of the, the expected uh, uh, detection uh, improvement uh, from the space fence, you are absolutely correct. Uh, there's an urgent need to improve the accuracy of object tracking and conjunction assessments. Otherwise, the operators will be overwhelmed with you know, 99.99999 false alarms on a daily basis, and they will just ignore those warning messages. So, so there is a critical need to look into how to improve that process. That's number one. Number two, as I stated earlier, even if you could track objects down to one centimeter in size, we are talking about on the order of 500,000 objects, one centimeter and larger. And again, the population at one millimeter and larger is about 100 million. So that is a major improvement to have the space fence now extending the uh, tracking capability to smaller objects. Unfortunately, that still only address less than 1% of the mission ending risk from orbital debris. It's just very unfortunate because the orbital debris population follows this power law of size distribution. There are many, many more small debris that could damage your spacecraft, cause your mission to end early, then the object big enough to cause a catastrophic breakup. So again, we need to look at this uh, in a balanced way to improve the accuracy of conjunction assessment, but also address the space situational awareness gap on the millimeter size orbital debris. Also pay attention to the protection aspect of the spacecraft you know, to better protect uh, future uh, space missions. Do you want me to tack on there? So there's a couple of pieces too. We're all in it together. If we don't hang together, we'll assuredly hang separately. So um, let's not play pin the rose, not that you're trying to. Let's come together. Let's work the problem. Let's understand that we're, be once again, in, in so much of what we do in this community, we're be behind the need, the need uh, curve, if you will, N-E-E-D. And let's just get after it, and, and, and we'll, we'll make it work. Uh, so, so there's that piece. I don't disagree with anything that, that you or JC have said, but I think there's other things to consider too, is that with space fence, we wanted to have two or three sites, preferably three sites, but with space fence, things that have higher uncertainties associated with um, how often things are tracked will get tracked more, right? So there's gonna be a little bit of a flux there. Um, so, so we should be able to, on, on the larger object size, we should probably be able to reduce some of those uncertainties. Uh, and similarly, you know, but as you get smaller, right, as you get to the point where space fences um, capability to detect, track uh, objects routinely and reliably, um, we're going to kind of have a new situation where those are fence-only objects, and unfortunately there's only one fence, so those are going to present a bit of a, a conundrum to us too because we're not going to have, you know, I remember my orbital mechanics class, you know, a sensor being hands on the hula hoop. We're not going to have enough, you know, we're going to have a new population that doesn't have enough hands on the hula hoop. Um, it's only going to have one hand on the hula hoop, and you have issues with that. So um, this is where other nation states, other commercial entities, et cetera, um, have g niches to fill, very valuable niches to fill. So I'd encourage the community to do that as well. So if I could just jump in for a second. I think it's clear that the current process is not meeting the needs of the user community right now. And so my response is the current system can't do that, so we need to change the system. And whatever that new system is, hopefully it is transparent, it's collaborative, it's got an open architecture, and it's got continuous improvement as some of the guiding philosophies. And if we can think of things in that way, I am very optimistic that with the ideas from the entire international community, we can figure out a great way to operate and Frankly, DOD has done a fantastic job of 
of doing what they've had to do in past decades, but if they can be relieved of this safety responsibility, I think some of the, the challenges that we've seen um, take place because they have had this dual mandate will no longer be holding us back. So I'm optimistic if we're willing to look at some new ways of operating and sprinkle in a little bit of customer service too. If, if there is an entity, commerce or whoever, that has this charge and it's their job to work with the user community as opposed to, well, here's some conjunction announcements, you know, You're good done. luck with that because we got other things to do, then that could help too. And to tack on to that, George, <laughs> one of the big things, the stumbling blocks, one of the big things we can get out of the way is the whole DOD acquisition process, which is, that's been a huge stumbling block because we have to do that process. It's mandated that the Department of Defense will acquire things, blah, 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 blah. The ability for another part of the interagency to be fast, agile, adaptive, responsive, innovative, all those kinds of things, is that's a game changer. Because frankly, just the way the environment, the acquisition environment that we live in in the Department of Defense, I, it, it ain't gonna change anytime soon. We're already late to need. So let's find a different way and do exactly what George and Diane said. And, and I'm just going to jump in also because um, earlier I said, you know, I like the word ecosystem. And that's, that's what I mean. It needs to be able to improve but, but in a flexible and nimble way. And, and that's why figuring out what is that basic service, not just making it so that it's accessible, but it really some of what you're talking about deal is because we don't drill down in the assumptions and, and, and we don't have the ability to and 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 they're going to change this the, you know what what we figure out oh well we have a problem here we're figuring it as if it was shaped like this and it's really like this or or whatever it is we we started with a different uh, one equation here and another one there it, that that's we could figure it out for now but it will be different in 10 minutes so we want to build something wherever however but it needs to be something that allows the capabilities, not just the U.S. commercial capabilities, but the capabilities to enter into it. It needs to be inclusive. It needs to get that trust and that vetting part of it and, and coming in, going out. But it also needs to be something that can continue to adapt and take those changes into consideration. And that's why we talk about things in terms of this ecosystem or this marketplace, that it isn't government versus commercial. It's something completely different than it's been before. And the hope would be, to kind of go back a few questions, that at some point, DOD will see value in utilizing this, this, this new, better mousetrap that we're all going to build together. Okay, that, that was a great discussion, very central, I think, to, to what this uh, uh, whole, whole conference is about. So that's great. Um, Jeff opened the door on the space domain awareness term, and I wanted to follow up on that a little bit, the, the term that Major General Shaw sent a me memo out last, last October that said basically all factors that can affect operations in space define what space domain awareness is. I work a lot in the international uh, community developing standards, space debris mitigation. What I see is that that term confuses the international community. And, and basically my question to Jeff is whether you agree with the following. Um, a couple weeks ago I did uh, comparisons of a dozen different definitions for SSA and a dozen different definitions for space traffic management. They're, they're all different. Um, so there's already confusion in, in those terms. Um, to me, this conference, the people that attend this, their focus really is on some set or subset of, of those definitions though, rather than needing to delve into safe, space domain awareness because that's really military aligned. That's really for the, fo for the purpose of assessing capabilities, intent, those sorts of things. And I just wanted to see if you agree with that and let this conference focus on SSA and STM. So, yes, I agree with you. Um, it's telling about, so everyone um, may or may not realize that General Raymond wears two hats. He's the commander of US Space Command. 
he was the commander of Air Force Space Command, and now he's the chief of space operations, essentially the chief of staff of the Space Force, uh, you know, akin to General Goldfein for the Air Force, and, you know, we can, we can talk across the other services, but we won't do that right now. Um, and I think it's telling that General Raymond didn't sign that memo and that it was General Shaw that signed that memo. And when you look at that, the bottom line on that memo, it's direction to what used to be Air Force Space Command to include Space and Missile Systems Center, who has a mandate to come up with a enterprise level space command and control system, finally, um, uh, that doesn't just do SSA. So there's some pieces moving in that regard. But I agree with you, SDA is, a, is, is, when I talk about the being ready to fight tonight or becoming more capable to fight tomorrow, that's where space domain awareness comes in from our perspective. Going back to definitions, if you guys need to hang your hats on definitions, my shop does JP314 on behalf of the joint staff. So um, we're looking at the definition for SSA to be the one that's in SPD3. I mean, hell, it was signed by the president, right? And it was handed by the president or handed to the president by the vice president, the National Space Council uh, lead. Uh, so we're going to use that definition. Um, and STM definition is going to come from SPD3 as well from our perspective, and that should go right in to the, um, uh, to, to the JP314 update. I mean, we've done it already um, with the, um, what, how we define operationally in our instructions for several years now, going on a decade of what is a breakup event versus, you know, what is a breakup versus, you know, an anomalous situation. We just went and took, before JC's time, we took Nick Johnson's definition and updated. We got, that's how you, you start to integrate and be interoperable is, is, is talking the same language and not using the same term um, erroneously. Thank you. Um, my name is Marushka. I'm one of the rare Europeans here, so my question is going to be a bit more international. Um, Diane, I was wondering if you could share your thoughts on LTS and um, the progress and how you see this is going to evolve. I know we have the working group 2.0 now, but if we can't even agree on, on the Bureau and how it should work, how can we achieve anything, even though we all agree that LTS is the way forward? If, if we can't, well, you know, it's a work in progress. It's, I think one good thing is people are taking it very seriously. It's not something that people are, are dismissing out of hand, oh, you know, just sort of, you know, making a, a quick decision and letting it go. But people, and by people I mean states, countries, are recognizing the importance of this work. And so there's, there's a, a way that we can read the situation as in, in, in a more positive light that has, you know, more, again, like I said earlier today, we all face challenges, but, you know, go big or go home. So the fact that they haven't been able to, to come up with a bureau, that's, that's, that's just meaning it's a, it's a speed bump. It's, it's not, um, and, and can we go forward? Well, really, the long-term sustainability guidelines are, um, they're voluntary, they're not binding, they're, they're certainly soft law, they rely on countries to implement them. That doesn't change regardless of what uh, the Bureau is formed and how it's formed and who, who uh, makes it up, we know that we have these 21 guidelines and that implementation, I mean, it was even in, in, in the copious report where, where you know, the, the guidelines were first brought forward to where they are now and from last June. And so I think we focus on what we have. Um, clearly, there's a lot of interest in um, making sure that we get this right we being the collective we, humankind, and if you look at 10 years, it took us 10 years to get the 21, so, you know, things don't happen so quickly, but they happen. So I, I don't think the fact that the, there was not agreement on the Bureau is, is a, a terrible thing. I think it's, it is what it is, and it doesn't uh, speak of the future, it speaks of the right now or, or, or the last week, and we go forward from there doing exactly what we said we were going to do, which is implement. And, and work together to show each other. And, and I think, you know, I know that um, our delegation at, at STSC, JC was there, we were messaging out. We were showing this is what we're doing. This is, uh, that was certainly an, an, 
implementation of LTS. That's why JC was there. That's why Dan, Dan was there. So I, I think these are positives, and you may not get what you want. Listen, we deal with that in my shop all the time. We didn't get everything we wanted, but so what? You, 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 you got some things, you go forward with what you got. Let me just add, add a very quick point here. So we like to joke that the LTS stands for long-term suffering <laughs> because it's a slow process. At the same time, it is a necessary process that we could leverage to establish uh, guidelines and best practices that we could uh, uh, use and work with not only the major uh, space faring nations, but also emerging space nations to address the orbital debris problem and other space environment problem together. Again, this is something that we all need to work together globally. And so that is a process we'll continue to work on. It is slow, but you will work at the end. Thank you, Mariva. HR Zucker, HRZ Tech. I'm gonna do a quick vignette. I, I need to do a survey, if that's okay with George. How many of you in this audience have ever seen an impact on any spacecraft that was done from a particle about two centimeters or greater. Just raise your hand. I'm just trying to get a sense of the audience if you've ever personally experienced what the effects look like from something in space. Okay, so we had about three hands. Okay, great. JC, you remember LDEF? Yes. Many, many years ago. Many, many years ago. So we're talking about 30 years ago, we were able to retrieve a panel. Uh, it was supposed to be a one-year experiment, and unfortunately we had a, uh, a tragic incident, so we were able to get it back on Earth. So people had an opportunity to study the things that you say are 10 to the 8th, pretty much. Yes. The things that we cannot see. So my question to you, I have for each one of you, for you, sir, is with that revelation going that far back 30 years ago and understanding that things do go very slowly, what initiatives we can do today? You know, you mentioned in SISU monitoring on orbit or something so you can see these objects. What can we do to help uh, to get the manufacturers more aware of these things and, you know, destructive testing? anything to get our hands to reduce <coughs> particle dispersion. Uh, is there anything that NASA is doing or working in collaboration with the Department of Defense? Because they do destruction testing for some acquisition programs. One of the tougher ones, of course, is spacecraft. Uh, and for Diane, the question I have would be, is there any opportunity, maybe that Strauss might be interested, Strauss Center would be interested in doing things like, uh, you know, you have the moot court for space lawyers, I, if I'm pronouncing it properly, correct me if I'm wrong. How about a traffic court, you know, something that the international community could game-wise participate and maybe contribute to some of the Schriever activities. So those are some of the things I'm asking. What kind of destruction capabilities we have, with NASA, Department of Defense, for hypervelocity type impacts and mitigating it. Uh, I would say that the Department of Defense, anything that we have in that arena would be made available to the interagency. Um, I think what we've done is unwittingly um, through hardness measures and the like, we've kind of mask the problem in a sense because we just you know we're living in our my high school physics teacher said that I don't know why a high school physics te teacher would say this but the topic of evolution came up in a physics class anybody in here take physics classes yeah I, I know I see all that <laughs> and but he talked about evolution being the ability to survive and if not grow in your own filth and I think what we've done is we've learned how to survive in our own filth um, and uh, and evolved in our own filth in space. Um, I think we got to get much better at miti mitigation. Um, and the the like I said earlier, the Department of Defense, at least in its contracting um, 
veined for, for payloads, U.S. Air Force and the like, um, are holding ourselves to the highest standards. Um, yeah, does that drive costs through the roof? Well, yeah, that's kind of a, a balance there. But um, um, I think uh, I think that's kind of a big piece of it too. But anything that we would have that we can contribute to modeling simulation um, in an effort to mitigate, and then in turn, um, anything that could be leveraged from remediation would be of interest as well. So the air depth you mentioned is a perfect example to actually collect direct measurement data on the small uh, uh, debris population in space. Uh, near the, the end of space shuttle operations, now that was more than 10 years ago, every time space shuttle went to the station and back you know, a week, 10 days, two window panels had to be replaced due to uh, impact damage by micrometeoroids and orbital debris. And the damage was driven by orbital debris. And even as today, every time we have a space exposed hardware returned from the International Space Station, NASA, we continue to survey, look at the surface, and then collect data to improve our understanding of the small debris environment at the station altitude. But that's 400 kilometers. Higher up, the environment is very different. And again, we don't have direct measurement data on the small debris to better uh, understand, to better improve the risk assessment for spacecraft operating above 600 kilometers. That's why we need to encourage the community to develop new technologies, propose missions to go higher up to collect data so that, that we can improve the, the reliability of impact risk assessment to better protect our future space missions. So to kind of weigh in also, to, to add to the, uh, my colleagues' answer about the, the particles and, and what can be done, I would posit to you that perhaps some of the work that the space sustainability ratings that Danielle was um, discussing in the, in the last panel yesterday would be very, it, it fits right in with that because I think that some of what they're looking at is things like materials. And so I would say that that would be a function for that going forward. And, and I think that they're cognizant of that in, in building out what, what, what it is that they're looking at as criteria for a, a sustainability rating in the different tiers. So I would offer that. Um, with regard to your question about like a, a, a traffic game or what have you, I have three, three things to add. Um, the International Institute of Space Law does a moot court. Um, it's a world competition. And the problem this year deals with um, issues concerning CDMs and SSA. So um, I invite you, if you are in a city where there's a regional competition, I know it's going to be in DC at the end of March, um, go and, and watch it. And I know you're in the DC area. You'll, you'll probably um, be filled with uh, amazement at what some of the young legal minds come up with in, in that particular, uh, with a, a set of issues that are near and dear to you. But in addition to that, I would say also that um, we heard a little bit from DINs yesterday about their, um, you know, their space law games, war game type thing. And I think that that's, an, that's another forum that's um, probably less formal than a moot court full-blown, which is what we, what the IISL puts on. You don't have to do a 30-page brief with a lot of, you know, specifics and parameters and, and more on the fly. But again, you know, figuring out, you know, given the, the you know, these are the, the facts that we have and now we change it, what do we get? And, and the third part of this answer is the SACT that I mentioned before and that the gentleman in the very back was talking about a little bit earlier in this Q&A session. That's also a, a place where you get to try out different scenarios, different variables, a number of different players. If you happen to be an academic or an operator or, and you have an interest in, in, in being involved, you get in touch with Bluestack. Um, they'll, they, you know, they may be able to hook you up, but that's another place where um, other, and because I really do think that there's a, a, an enormous value in um, you know, role playing and, and figuring things out because you, know, you, you kind of burn those neural pathways and you're not, it helps you with that preparation part of the mission. So um, that's, that's what I got for you. So we're coming to the end of our time period. But uh, I want to offer each of our panelists a chance to share their closing thoughts and takeaways to the group. Uh, Jeff, let's start with you. I would just say collaboration is the key. Increased collaboration is the key. Um, and if we can't do that, then, then we're failing. Um, and, and, and that's, uh, so if you think you're going to run off and, you know, make a gazillion dollars on your own um, magical answer, 
um, you're probably not thinking the right way. I mean, in my not so humble opinion, so collaboration is the key. Okay, JC. So the SPD3, the National uh, Space Traffic Management uh, Policy, is a short document. Uh, uh, but the term orbital debris was repeated 32 times in the policy document. The term safe or safety is repeated 30 times in that policy document. Therefore, if safety is a priority for space traffic management, orbital debris is a priority. If safety is a priority for space traffic management, then the risk from small debris, the SSA gap on small debris is a priority. Diane, final word. Well, I think you've heard enough from me today. <laughs> but yeah, progress through collaboration, and I think we, we need to be uh, cognizant of all of these priorities. Thank you. Please help me thank our panelists for an excellent discussion today.